what uh, happened during World War II, I was uh, just finishing a uh, degree in science, actually uh, in chemistry, and uh, I was, because of a scientific background, I was commissioned directly in the Navy as an officer, so I didn't have to go through <laughs> some of the uh, preliminaries on that. But uh, the reason was that that was at a time when uh, they needed to train some people as radar officers in the Navy, because it was such a critical part in those early years of the war. And uh, it was during those years in the Navy that uh, had some remarkable revelation and understanding. Some of the things that uh, you start to question while you're going through a university and people are throwing different ideas in all directions. And uh, so it was really during one of the major battles in World War II that uh, felt the Lord speaking to me in a, in a very, very powerful way, dramatic way. And I won't take time to go through that other than uh, John 14, 6. It's as if the Lord spoke directly that uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me. And uh, so it was, it was such a clear revelation and threw away all of the other questions that I developed during my university days. Uh, Prior to that, going through radar school, there was something that came up that I've never forgotten, and that is uh, uh, actually a sort of a secret type of program at MIT. It was uh, actually a secret building, not related directly to MIT. But the Admiral greeting us by saying that, uh, uh, how well you listen and how well you react will be a matter of life and death. And uh, I kept remembering that through the years and as we got to the point of uh, setting up schools for the now University of the Nations, that there was uh, going to be a lot of uh, uh, new types of listening that would be important if we were to really, really understand what the Lord wanted and that how well we listened to Him, and how well we acted according to what He directed would be a matter of life and death. And uh, So as part of our schools, of course, as we reached out to develop programs, that uh, it was so, so very important that uh, it wasn't just bringing in content and clever new things and new techniques and so on, but what is it that the Lord is saying in each situation, in each school, whether whatever the college would be or whatever the center would be, that uh, we would be listening for Him. And of course, I feel that still so very strongly today that uh, we'll get more and more great ideas, but are those the ideas that Lord is providing, or are those are our great ideas, and based on maybe some very successful experiences. And I, I felt, first of all, in going into the uh, University of Illinois, I originally had no intent to become a professor at university. It's one of those things that uh, I felt the Lord leading me into. Um, and. Uh, amazing set of circumstances that I was appointed to a position at the University of Illinois, which is considered one of the best chemistry departments at the time in the world. So uh, it was a tremendous opportunity because of the resources available and the top quality students that came in from all parts of the world. Um, but the uh, I, re I remember one 
situation in the first few years. You know, research, of course, is as important or sometimes considered more important than teaching your classes and so on. Uh, which seems strange in some ways for a university, but in another way it's not because it's the research which can now maybe affect millions of people instead of the people in front of your class and so on. But uh, I was just up at the board discussing a particular subject and I thought the Lord give me an idea and I went back to my office and laboratory and tried the idea and within, a, within an hour or two I knew the idea was really going to work very well. There was some for some instrumentation that was then used in laboratories all over the world. Uh, that was one and then uh, when I first joined the staff at the University of Illinois, the uh, professors, graduate students, and so on had really no idea what had happened during World War II in the field of electronics and how it would affect new types of instrumentation, which they could then put together and uh, advanced their research in major ways. And this was true for all of the engineering areas, the all of the science areas, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. So uh, I was asked to give a, a course on electronics for scientists. And uh, really felt the Lord leading in that. And this was now based on the experience I had gained during World War II. Is, in, in the whole area of radar. And the course turned out to be very, very successful. Uh, and uh, I just felt the Lord just led me step by step in developing that particular program, the people that worked with me. So those are some of the very early, early situations, which then multiply you know, over and over again through the years. Well, the area of spectroscopy, yeah, that uh, was not my major research area at first because uh, although it was of great interest, the professor who had been teaching this for many, many years was retiring and asked me if I would take his course, uh, teach his course, and I said, well, okay, you know, I'll have to. And so, uh, soon most of my research was now focused on the area of spectroscopy because it was for me to learn as well as I wanted to direct a lot of the students I now had doctoral students into that area and again it's like the Lord leading step by step and Yeah, well, spectroscopy is a very broad topic, really. It uh, involves not just the visible uh, spectrum, of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it involves all of the whole range from, you can talk about x-rays, you can talk about gamma rays, you can talk about ultraviolet light and infrared light and so on and that whole range all the way into the electromagnetic uh, uh, waves that are used for television and that sort of thing. So it covers the entire electromagnetic spectrum and much of our, uh, many of the devices and systems that are used for all sorts of things, analyses, determining what uh, is in the soils, what's in your blood, what's in your everything uh, is related to this whole area of spectroscopy. So, uh, that's a pretty poor definition, but it's, it, it involves a lot, of, a lot of different types of instruments. Someone came up to me yesterday and said, you know, uh, we use atomic the, uh, absorption spectroscopy, and I said, uh, he said, you probably don't know anything about it. I said, yeah, I know a little about it. We invented a few <laughs> early instruments. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it covers a wide, wide range. And it was an exciting area, so uh, for the first uh, 
I mean, uh, 20 years, most of my doctoral students became expert in spectroscopy and some of the, today, some of the world experts in, in that area. So the Lord reveals a lot. You know, the Lord said, I am the light of the world, you know. And uh, it's an intriguing area because uh, we go to Genesis and uh, you did, they did, we didn't need the sun and the moon at that time. <laughs> at the last end of the last chapter, and which one of the last two chapters of Revelation again, you will no longer need the sun and the moon because Jesus will be the light that you need. It's quite uh, staggering when you start to think about what that really means. And so uh, someday I would hope that perhaps we can put in writing some of the things that the God has been revealing over the years. That indicates that when we talk about light, we're not just talking about the lights we turn on in the room or do things like that, but we really are talking about what, what is it going to mean when the end of the age comes. Uh, Jesus is the light. I don't know. But it's, we could go on and on, you know. I teach a whole graduate course in that one area, but uh, it's, it's staggering. It was about 1969, um, and I'm not quite sure why, but this the thought, the Lord saying something that. Uh, you're going to be moving in a different direction. And uh, I uh, first heard about YWAM, by the way. That was in 1970, as I recall, late 70s. Uh, and at that time, uh, my oldest daughter, Cynthia, was present. Uh, my present son-in-law, Tom Wilmer, Cynthia's husband, had heard at the same time, the same church. We were attending, Cynthia was home from the university and uh, Tom was just finishing a degree after his military service. Uh, and uh, I just said, well, you know, if I were younger, that would be the kind of organization I'd be interested in. And I don't know why I even said that, but because <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed the work that I was involved with. Um, but what uh, any serious part of that was, and I don't remember the dates exactly, as I believe it was either the end of 73, 1973, or the first of 1974, that uh, since now Tom and Cynthia were in YWAM and gone through the SOE and so on in Switzerland, that um, I, sh well, I had been visiting in those few years some of the bases around the world. I'd gotten acquainted and I was really impressed by the love of Jesus that was demonstrated every place I visited. So, uh, but uh, when uh, we yeah, I, my wife and I said, look, uh, Lauren Cunningham is going to be speaking in East St. Louis for a three-day session over the weekend. And uh, Joy Dawson was with him, going to be speaking, and um, Campbell Bacalpon, the three of them were going to be speaking in East St. Louis. And uh, so we drove over from Champaign-Urbana, University of Illinois. And uh, as uh, now they had just come from, uh, well, Lauren had just come from a meeting in Hilo, an all-night all prayer time, in which YWAM had, uh, he said, was being challenged to develop educational resource materials that would uh, really provide biblical worldview training in all the areas 
at all age levels, in all cultures, you know. Uh, and uh, then he described, this was just the week before this meeting in East St. Louis, and uh, he described uh, the way that some of the things that the Lord was saying, and that there happened to be some of the uh, university educators at that prayer meeting, they were saying, well, those terms aren't educational terms and so on. Uh, and uh, instead of having the pyramid, you know, it was upside down pyramid and, and words like uh, modular and whatnot. And he, well, he was being told these aren't educational materials, uh, terms. And he didn't understand how they could re relate it all to this big vision that was now being given to YWAM, developing educational resource materials. Uh, and a program that was known for its uh, grassroots evangelism, now going to be developing educational resource materials. And so I, uh, uh, at, at lunchtime, I said to the, to Lauren, I said, those aren't strange materials names to me. I'm, I'm in education and uh, I've written books using those terms and whatnot. And so that started our relationship. And again, I don't remember the exact date. It was early 1974. And uh, it wasn't too long after that that I had a situation sick and whatnot. And that I had missed classes for the first time in 25 years or whatever, and and uh, yet the Lord keeps saying, you're going to become involved with Wiley. So I mentioned it to my wife, and she thought I was delirious. And uh, so uh, she did ask by the end of this time that uh, for real confirmation, is this really what you're saying, Lord. So I had definite confirmations from several different directions, uh, from the U.S. all the way to Australia on a lecture trip that I was involved in. And uh, so I told the university I was going to be leaving. I had uh, research team of 24 doctoral people at the time. Um, and it would be three years before most of them would be phased out. So I prayed about that and thought I should go to the university that I was going to be leaving by the end of 1977. And uh, they thought I was crazy. And uh, so that was uh, an interesting time. Because of that, the words... You know, in science and technology, this it's a tremendous grapevine all over the world. You know, things spread fast. So every place I would go <laughs> around the world, they'd say, "What's this we're going to do?" And I said, Ooh, "Tell them." You know, so they would stand around asking questions for an hour or two. Whereas if you ever mentioned what your beliefs were before, you know, they hastily have another appointment in five minutes. So that was sort of the beginning. Now, what the reason uh, for going into YWAM, I did not know. All I knew was to lay down my career and uh, go into YWAM. Now, I felt that it probably had something to do with this development of educational resource materials. Because uh, that was uh, a vision that had really startled Lauren, too, because of me. Although he had a, always had a great interest in education, to uh, the sense of being able to develop educational resource materials that could impact every age level, every culture, you know, every area of society. Just to write one book, you know, it takes so long, as you know, it's, uh, to uh, be such a broad based. Vision. Um, 
but make a long story short, and I did uh, at the end of 77. Uh, I, Lauren and I started to give some seminars together, and that was one we had scheduled late in 77. In 77. And uh, he met me, I think as he has probably described in <laughs> several situations, and uh, we sat in his little bare room those two metal chairs that he talks about. And he said, uh, we have just had confirmation from the international YWAM uh, advisory group that uh, the vision to have a university is definitely being confirmed by the other leaders in, in YWAM. And uh, so I just said to Lauren, well, I know, because the year before, I had been asked to uh, consider taking a position in head of a, another major university. And I knew I was going into YWAM, so I started right away to just answer the request, and I... Knew one thing about YWAM in those few years before that whatever you do, you pray about. Whatever comes along, you pray about. There's got to be a reason. So I prayed, and the Lord said, uh, I wasn't tempted, in other words, to go into this other direction. By the way, Lauren said something then, which I've, I've repeated many, many times to other people that when you get you make your decision to come into YWAM, you will probably have some of the best offers that you've ever seen, ever heard about. <laughs> and that was true. I mean, they just started to come one right after the other. And, I, and uh, so I wasn't tempted by this, this offer, but I prayed about it. And that's when the Lord said, YWAM is going to have a university and you're going to be a part of developing that. And... Um, so I didn't you know, talk to anybody about it other than uh, my wife. And uh, So when Lawrence said, we're going to have a university, I said, I knew it. No, and I think he probably heard his story on that. Uh, and that was thrilling. It was thrilling because if I had been told I was coming into YWAM to help develop the university, well, I was not involved with the university. I was. Tremendous research group, uh, uh, exciting times developing new courses here. Why go to another place to develop the university? And what uh, became so clear at that time that it was important that I did not know. I don't know even how to explain that today, other than that I had laid down that background. Whatever I'd learned in those many years in other universities and teaching and research was not a significant part of my being involved. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? Well, it meant that the university that was to be formed was going to be something so different, so unique, so much, his university, that if we tried to carry in our ideas and our experiences, or anyone tried to carry in their own ideas, it wasn't going to work. And no matter if we had all the money in the world to hire the so-called experts, the best people in the world, to come in and teach and direct and all of the rest in the university, that we wouldn't be able to develop the university that he wanted. And that became so very, very clear. So it was a key time. You know, simple, it's so simple, but it's so basic. And it's still so basic today. You know, in fact, as we develop further and further in the University of the Nations and have all these schools now in 110 nations around the world, you get a lot of good ideas. But are those the ideas that our Lord really wants in this university? Are those, uh, you know, 
going to be just man's good ideas. And um, so those that early time was extremely important. And then, of course, so what is this university? And we knew the only way we were going to get the answer is to be on our knees most, well, essentially all the time. Yeah, and that is the thrilling thing, I think, about the start of the university, uh, was that he kept revealing things to us day by day. By day. And uh, so I, I guess the way to put it is, as long as, it goes back to that, the early Navy days, and, uh, how well you listen. And I guess that was the uh, beauty of the early years, and I know you were part of that, Betty, uh, that we were listening. And every time we threw in our own good ideas, things slowed down. And if I was to look at one thing that is the danger, of course, as we keep moving forward, the university, more and more exciting things that are happening are going to happen. That as soon as we think we have it, we have the formula, that's when we'll go We'll level off and go backwards, go downhill. So those are the things that I think were taught to us so beautifully during those early years. And so God kept revealing something almost, well, I guess we could say daily, every day, and brought people aboard that uh, in that first 10 years that are, were absolutely amazing. In terms of just the physical part, the scientists, the engineers, the the uh, architects and so on, you know, that you couldn't go out and hire around the world, top flight people. And uh, then in developing the courses, God kept bringing people who were looking to him every day for the answers. What is the Barnett supposed to be doing? The things that uh, he revealed to us early on, of course, was that he could teach us. The Holy Spirit could reveal things to us in every course, in every discipline. And that uh, when we really did listen to what he had to say, that there'd be, you know, it might be a course by which we'd be familiar with in any university we would go to, but it would be with different perspective, different background, different uh, uh, objectives, even, than what we had originally anticipated. Um, and of course, that's, I guess, my hope and dream still, is that we'll be so open during every course, in every discipline, every area of society, that what comes through will be exactly what the Lord wants. And uh, that he can speak to us any moment during that class. Now, it doesn't mean that, that people who are leading the school uh, have not prepared. I mean, they've prepared very well, and that's why they're, they, they're tuned in to hear. But how do we get that across, you see? Because we get... A lot of people with lots of expertise, lots of background. How do they remain open? It's really only if they understand that very simple principle. If Lord, what is it that you're saying? What is it that you want? And, uh, I guess uh, I don't want to go off in the wrong direction from your question here, but... Uh, uh, you know, about a dozen years or more ago now, we started this course, um, Project Development Leadership. And uh, I started that with the idea that, well, we got so many tremendous visions coming up, popping up all over the world in YWAM and for the university that uh, nothing's happening with 
those wonderful visions because I said, well, people just don't know how to plan well. But I soon found out that uh, it was something a little different, in fact, really radically different in many ways, that instead of uh, remembering all the wonderful things they've exercised and used in terms of knowing the character of God and what God would say to them and praying through on things, that when it went to planning, that there was a real break and a shift in the mode of thinking. So that no longer, now, are you just looking for what God has to say on the plan, but you're looking for what well, someone really has the expertise out there. You know, wonderful Christians and so on, but is that what the Lord is saying for you? So that transition from vision to project to plan is a breaking point. It's a breaking point then, it's a breaking point today. One of the things I, I am concerned about. And then if you finally get through to develop a plan, which is truly of the Lord, he's led every step of the way in the plan. But the transition now to uh, activation, to carrying it out, to implementing. You now again start looking unconsciously almost for the expertise that someone else has which might be very good expertise for their particular application, but is not what the Lord is saying again. So that transition to implementation and then finally follow through to completion uh, isn't there. So how to uh, you know, recognize the dangers on that? Maybe I... I uh, I, I would say this, I am thrilled that a lot of people are now trying to follow the principles that we thought the Lord giving us in terms of the courageous leaders transforming their world. But, uh, and I can say that, that again because it's, I, I really felt, David and I, David Hamilton and I, we actually wrote on that book in I guess it's on essentially every continent and nations all over the world as the Lord led us. And he really uh, put together the things that, uh, what we had started to note throughout that course. You know, a lot of people were following the things they learned in the Positive Development Leadership School and seminars, but uh, It's such a simple thing, simple idea, that it uh, almost shouldn't take any uh, particular uh, time to think it through, but it's so big, so big. And it's what we, I, I guess <laughs> I'm saying it because it goes back to what the Lord gave us in such a powerful way. We knew we had no other way to go in the early years. Lord, what are you saying? And we could see any time we weren't doing that consistently through the whole group, not just some small group, but the whole group, the whole staff, the people involved in the program, uh, that we'd level off and we could see things start to drop off. Every time we would then have the long prayer times and asking the Lord since you start moving back up and you can just plot that. I think we talked about that in the past. You could plot just <laughs> how our prayer time, times went. Sorry for the long-winded explanation there, but it's, it is a simple, simple thing. But um, so basic. And basic for the future of the University of Washington. Again, that very simple word, servant leadership. And um, it's been one of the great things about, I think, YWAM's development from its birth, servant leadership. 
were very meager to founded it and all the way through. But um, and when it comes to a university, there is the danger, you know, of you know, the world expert here and the world expert there, and so on. And that's that's fine for the world to recognize some of those things. But if we ever start thinking that we have the world experts, uh, we're going to be in in trouble. You know that that's why it's going ahead. In fact, it might even look like we're going ahead for periods, and then we'll go downhill. And yet we want our students to be, you know, the world leaders, definitely. But the world leaders from the perspective that they are really following what the Lord says. Uh, so serve in leadership. You know, desiring to serve first. As you, as you know, we have people that come in with the idea that, well, you know, I've been a great leader. And we have those. And so... I'm going to bless you by providing my leadership. Not consciously even, but subconsciously. That's our danger. If we ever turn and focus on the so-called world leaders instead of the Lord's leaders. Uh, so I understand present leadership. You know, I know we talk about it. YWAM in general and U of N definitely. It's one of those basic and principles. And then I think another one that's just so different because it was so powerful those early years to realize that we now had a mandate that was a great commission. A great commission mandate. In other words, we're to impact every area of society. Uh, and really, in that sense, going back to what the Lord was telling YWAM in 1974 with that prayer meeting in Hilo, that to develop, develop educational resource materials uh, that would impact every area of society. I mean, it sounded so crazy. I mean, really, you know, anyone who was in education, every area of society, every age level, you know, from birth to death to uh, across every boundary you could ever set up and uh, I guess I might just kind of drop back to well, one thing that because I was asking that question I didn't come into the university to YWAM to set up to help set up the university I came in because the Lord showed me to come in then when I was asked to be and traded through I realized I was to be a part of that and uh, so I repeatedly asked the Lord, what is it? How does that relate to this prayer meeting that I heard about a few years before, 1974? And uh, it's one of those times when I felt the Lord made it very clear, almost as if he was speaking to me, that uh, the university is going to be the source for much of this educational resources that uh, the university that will be involved in every area will be involved in all the nations and cultures around the world and from that from the students that are released will provide that educational material that can cover every area every age level and of course, today, if we look at what's been accomplished, there have been books, obviously, there have been you know, a few programs like the Early Childhood Education Program, but that's hardly a start. Uh, and yet, the foundation is being formed in all the different universities, uh, in all the different colleges, centers, and so on. So I think it is realistic that it could happen, and can happen, and it will happen. If that's what the Lord said, and I believe that he did. Servant leadership, of course, is an easy term to state, but really what does it mean? And I, I think uh, it's a little bit like uh, Greenleaf had talked about when he wrote his book, uh, <laughs> Servant Leaders, which is really a... Uh, 
related to the alphabet servant leader was Jesus. But uh, the whole idea of serving first, serving others first, uh, and not trying to be a leader first, and then serving people by being a leader, which you can be, obviously. So it's a subtle thing and gets very much mixed up. I mean, I've known heads of corporations who were servant leaders, really. They were thinking always of the best for the people, their employees, other people on the staff, and so on. And what would help them be better in what they do? And to relate to them. I mean, to really be genuinely interested in them. And uh, not just the technique, because that's what can happen, of course, is to love person who goes to maybe lead first, to be a leader. I've had many people come in and tell me they want to be a leader. You know. And uh, so what uh, what is it? That I think it comes evident quite quickly that if you are really interested in the welfare of the people that you are working with, that uh, to serve them, and then have a choice that, well, if I now do take leadership, because oftentimes these people will be asked to be leaders, uh, that uh, they will remain interested in the people and not in being the leader. It's such a subtle thing. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, that's one of the dangers we we have for the future always, you know, that you have more and more people who have been good leaders, reliable leaders, but they want to not be the leader rather than to just serve people. And in one sense, I think it's servant leadership becomes very evident if the people that are working with you uh, become themselves servants whether they themselves uh, uh, are more interested in the people they're working with than they are in their own advancement or doing a particular thing. Um, I think and it was a word I like, of course, is the idea of creativity. God has given everybody creative abilities. He's everybody, really. Uh, and how do you, as a leader, then draw out that creativity from them instead of you do this, you do that, and so on? Use my creativity. And in one sense, that's what we would hope that our courses do, you know, if we're teaching, that somehow we are drawing out the creativity from the, those who are taking part, other staff people. You know, and the students. Uh, that's, uh, I would hope, in fact, that the University of the Nations, that we will improve continuously in that whole direction. And it can only really happen if, as a leader now, you've made the choice of being a leader that, and then we ask to be a leader, that you have the opportunity. You are released with the necessary whatever it takes, resources or whatever, in order to be to allow your people that you're working with to be creative. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes universities are looked at, well, we teach people, you know, that's what our job is. And of course, in a sense, that's a very, very small part of a university. It's not an unimportant, it's a very important part. But uh, are we really, in every one of our programs, releasing people that can now be creative in the things that God has called them to, to reach their destiny in the Lord? 
you know, it's so easy to get into the trap of, you know, you want to really do a good job in teaching and so on, but sometimes it's because I just want to be recognized as a good teacher. And that can have very little to do with it. What are you behind the scenes drawing out the creativity? Providing resources. In fact, I've always felt, even I've, I've watched corporate leaders many, many years ago when I was still quite young. And, and, and uh, in the Navy, uh, the uh, really good leaders in the Navy, what were they able to do? Somehow they could provide a a challenge that would release the creativity of the people that were working. And I've seen that dramatically happen in, in, in certain places. They change into a leader, both well-trained leaders, you know, one that was there and one that's coming into place. And uh, all of a sudden the whole nature of that program changes. And the best example, I if you remember my tell, I mentioned this before, Betty, but it was uh, uh, in a battle zone in World War II. They changed the captain of the ship. Everyone else stayed the same. Surroundings, I mean, that big Pacific Ocean stayed the same. But from a nervous, tense ship, within a matter of a couple of weeks with a new captain, uh, the whole nature changed. The way people operated. Uh, and what was it? I mean, it was just the way of accepting those people that were there and giving them the opportunity to do the job they were called to do. Instead of scaring the living daylights out of them, you know. That's a part of servant leadership. I think there's something like that. Um, a servant leader is one who will bring unity in any program. With all the other conditions, several hundred people, all under the same conditions, but all of a sudden things change. It's one thing I like about team sports. Uh, and I've, I've studied uh, coaches and so on for... <laughs> For years and years, one of my favorite pastimes is watching what a different coach and coaches can do. And drawing up the abilities of the people. So that is related to servant leadership, but it also brings up that other topic of unity. And if there's one thing that uh, I feel that we had in those early years for the University of Devon, we had unity. Everyone didn't agree with everyone else, obviously. But we did have unity. There's a unity of the spirit. And uh, that's community. So uh, we always, you know, we mentioned in YWAM that we want to be a groups uh, in community. We want to, and uh, so unity and diversity, that whole idea. And I know we talk about teamwork a lot in our organization. And yet, I uh, had an example just this last year uh, on that, in teaching uh, in the LTS, in which the group of 170, I guess, we had in that program, that uh, it was divided up into 30-some teams. Now, probably every one of the people in that group had some time or other heard many times, of course, lectures and talks on teamwork and had taught themselves on, on teamwork. Uh, but there were a few of those teams that just couldn't come together and developing actually plans for some fairly major programs. And so it was an interesting study to, to watch why it was happening as we went around to the different groups. And it, uh, I think one group took, or definitely took over one week meeting day and night. I mean, they were serious about why they weren't working and they couldn't. And they just couldn't hear the other people. They were so interested in, 
what they had learned, what they knew, that they couldn't hear. And then they finally got to it. I mean, they went, went along very well. Now, they were from different, some different cultures and different ways of doing things. And, but coming back to unity, <laughs> um, University of the Nations will only develop if they really understand unity and servant leadership are sort of related. And it relates back to servant leadership. <laughs> in other words, that you are as interested in what anyone else has ideas, has ideas what other, other ideas people might have, and are interested enough to listen. I mean, so... Um, that's now again, of course, all of these points come to some very, very strong scriptural truths. And one of the things that I noticed in those early years, and especially during the 40 days of prayer and fasting, I don't know, were you, were you here at that time? That would have been about 80, 80, 80 1980, I think, probably. Uh, that the Lord kept calling us back, you know, wonderful things coming out and all these things of impacting every area of society and discipling of the nations and so on, but the uh, love passages in the scriptures. And uh, the Lord bringing us back to, you know, his, what he said was the major commandment. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second commanded, neighbor as yourself. And that those, you can't have unity without, real unity without, even if you don't express it well, that there's somehow a love for the other people. And the ability to listen to what they have to say. One of the questions that I uh, been asked, you know, is what is a Christian university? What is a Great Commission university? And uh, so I wrote out some things, and it particularly came after a, um, a big international conference that we had, um, a scientific conference. And the Several, quite a few of the doctoral students that had done their degrees with me, and they, uh, I'd ask them, please don't say anything about me during this time, you know, that they had a tendency to do. And so some of them were from all the way back 40 years ago and 30 years ago and 20 and so on. And, uh, one of the things uh, they were to report on their latest research and so on. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, said that what they remembered was after they had taken their oral exam, at the end of the oral exam, I would ask the question. Now, after spending four years, <laughs> five years uh, working on other research, uh, I would ask the question, now what would really be an ideal solution to your work? And uh, each one of them then, as I say, some 40 years before, 30 years before, would say, it was that challenge or the idea that they were now just reaching after 30 years the idea to that question. And it made me think, you know, that how about for the University of the Nations? What would make an ideal? And that's why I wrote down some of these things that after, right after that uh, particular conference. And uh, I guess I could say something about, uh, uh, first and foremost, I believe a Christian university is a people. A people called by God, a people of eternal destiny. 
And then, of course, what is a great commission in university, since that's basically what we have, that's our mandate. It is a Christian university that is a special mandate to be a discipler of the nations. And they are a people who go and are involved in discipling all nations. They are typically a people from many locations, a people with various functions and responsibilities, but with a focus on the creator of the universe. The buildings and the equipment are important, but people are the life of the university. All the people associated directly or indirectly with the university are important. They include the students, the teaching and administrative staffs, the operational and maintenance staffs, and the families, friends, and associates of students and staff. These are the people who are the university. And uh, so that whole thing then about what would be an ideal university, just a few of the steps that I wrote down after that, that meeting was the, the people who are the university would know God intimately and their hearts would be on fire to make him known. Uh, the people would be committed and become engaged in the great commission given by Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. The campus community would express the love of Jesus in numerous tangible ways. Again, such a simple statement, but we could do everything else right to the world. We would look like we had the best communication, college, the best whatever, college. And yet, if we did not really have that love, God's greatest commandment, we would have failed. I feel stronger and stronger about that. And the people would work together in unity and would be a catalyst for unity in the body of Christ. And the people would be obedient to the word of God. The programs, courses, and activities would be inspired by the Holy Spirit and be designed to release God's gifts of creativity in students and staff and the people groups they serve in ministries. And the list goes on. You know, what would you add to it? Um, I think that whole thing, just I was, uh, I was really kind of blown away when these former students would say one little question like that. And we should be asking that question. What would make an ideal University of the Nations? Um, it's uh, these were were men uh, who had become world famous now, and uh, I don't believe some of them had really found what the ideal is for their lives, but they had found the ideal for at least one area and had been asking that question for many years. They had turned and had dozens and dozens of people working with them trying to solve that one idea. But can we state that whole thing? What is the ideal university of the nations? And really have our groups now all over the world, working on that, developing. You know, uh, in terms of the size of a group, I personally do not believe that it should make any difference whether you have 2,200 people, 2,000 people, 20,000 people that the nature of the group will be reflected on what has been its overall worldview, what would be uh, demonstrated by the leadership. So if the leadership feels it's a very authoritative and transactional leadership, we're going to develop uh, that kind of a program that will drift very quickly away from the very principles Nothing to do with size, I don't believe. The size will not make any difference if the leadership is carrying out the principles that are very basic to
to good leadership. First, servant leadership, considering the welfare of every individual, um, the destiny of every individual, and that we are a people, you know, called by God, whatever area you're called into. And that that is made so clear because, again, it won't be done by human technique. But it will be done by things that the Lord is showing you to do. And one of the things, of course, is communication. You can't uh, just communicate with a small group of leaders. You've got to communicate with every individual what the, what the vision is. And the vision has to be repeated over and over when you're bringing in new people all the time. And uh, that... Uh, I mean, it's so obvious, but it's unfortunately neglected as you get busy in your leadership role that uh, you do not continually communicate what the vision is and what it is, where you are at that time relative to the vision. And to recognize that a vision, here I get into some of my <laughs> beating the drum in terms of that uh, the vision has to be translated into specific projects. I mean, a, a, a vision is not a project because the project is a specific... Well, I better not get into all of that. The point being that uh, you, as you move into all the different projects and different colleges and so on within a university, because you're now covering every area of society and... Uh, uh, so many different types of uh, programs. Uh, how do you keep that related to the vision? The vision is what we've said is uh, to disciple all nations. That's, that's our vision. And uh, projects, if you're in one college, College of Communication, College of science and technology or whatever, you're going to be spending a lot of time focusing on that particular area and drawing out the creativity of the people that are in that group. But it's important to recognize how that is just one part of the overall vision. And uh, I, don't, I hope I don't divert too much here, but other than to say that a danger that we have as we get stronger and stronger programs in colleges uh, and centers uh, that we have the danger of uh, not recognizing that that's just a part of the overall vision and that without all of the parts that we're going to have trouble. If we start saying, well, that's not as important as mine. Now, I, I know that should be very obvious, but I heard that spoken just a couple of weeks ago. You know, you can get along without that college or that center, but you can't get along without this that that person happened to be a leader in. Um, sounds like a fairly innocent statement in a way, but it isn't. It's deadly. It's a deadly statement. And we'll lose it. And, we'll, and so going back to what really brought up there, what about for the larger group? How do you maintain? Well, I think there's only one way, and that is to repeat over and over again in innovative ways that the Lord can give of what the vision is. And that there is an overall... Um, Unity that must be uh, carried out. And what is that? You know, it doesn't mean that I have to know all about all the things that are go going on and how to do things in all the different areas. But I do need, and everybody needs to know, that every part is important. And again, I guess it's a matter of looking over and over again at what Jesus would say. How would he want you to act? How would he want you to react? I do believe that uh, at the present time we've been talking about uh, groups of maybe not much more than 2,000. 
but that's no magic number. That's just a practical side so that we would get uh, programs distributed in all parts of the world. You know, whether it's a thousand locations or ten thousand locations eventually that uh, there's something good about working it in groups of maybe only two thousand max to three thousand but not that's not a rule it's just something that we felt that the Lord was showing us a long time ago so this campus was intended to build up to a maximum of two thousand the one thing that re really did happen in those early years that was so good is every time we saw something slowing down, we would say, look, we really need to pray about this as the whole group of all of the staff and so on, and bring in some others from outside too. And that uh, it's not, again, a matter of being involved physically, but in terms of being involved spiritually. That we're all part and this was particularly true because I was very much involved with seeing that these buildings got built and all of the underground stuff and the roads and, and uh, all the stuff we had to put under the ground. And it was a great group. You know, we had a wonderful team working on it in terms of engineers, architects, project managers, and so on. But as soon as subconsciously, all of the staff would be saying, a lot of the staff would be saying, well, you know, they're doing a great job. Great. You know, I'm all for it. But not really praying about that group working, we would level off. And that's when we would call a meeting and say, look, let's all pray about this. We're all part of this particular aspect. And um, it wasn't something just for early childhood education. It wasn't something just for the administrative office and so on. Now, how do you maintain that? Now, I've seen corporations that were able to do it because they had a leader who understood. Uh, you could say, well, that's because he was a good administrator. He did MBAs and, you know, got doctorate degrees or whatever in administration. But no, I don't think that's the case. They won't maintain it. I've seen a lot of those that failed miserably. But that question is so important because you can fade so fast if you start looking at just your thing in the spirit. Again, physically, you probably have to in order to maintain your sanity and keep working effectively in your particular area. Um, I would say that at the present day, if in many of our groups around the world, we would ask everybody. And we would find that very few of them are thinking of the whole. And most are still. And it's understandable, getting your foundation. But how can we, while they are getting the foundation and expertise in their own area, also have in the spirit as much concern about what this other group over here is doing as we are doing in our group. Oh, that's again so simple, and God gives us the ability to do that. That's the thing. There is a danger for people who have a lot of expertise to be very attractive to bring into your program. And uh, we certainly want to do that. If they are truly called of God and not just interested in what it interesting group we happen to have. Um, it's probably one of the biggest biggest concerns I would have. And it doesn't say we don't want people <laughs> to come in with a world of expertise and so on, but that that's not the solution. I'll ask you one question. Uh, you were telling me a few weeks ago that uh, the, the characteristic of the next years will be communication, that we get explosion in communication. How that will affect, I mean, all that explosion in communication, all the globalization, you know, where all cultures now seem to be one, yes. that, how, how yeah. will it affect us to, to keep these principles? That's one of our hopes, certainly, wouldn't it be, that we would now be able to communicate so well and instantly 
that there wouldn't be that barrier of trying to go through all the red tape and making things work well and uh, whether our genesis is working and whatnot, but it would be boom, every place. And we could really communicate our feelings and do it beautifully. So I think there is great, great uh, possibilities. It's interesting how this war, which has come upon us in the last couple of months, of course, is breaking two of the very, very important things that, and that one is the better to really pursue this communication thing in a easy fashion, I would say, and in the transportation. All of a sudden, you know, we hold ourselves back a little bit because, well, gee, they have to stand in that line at the airport for several hours and you have to do this and have to do that. Um, but no, I think that the communication really and uh, the fact that that is related to light. I mean, the whole new world of communication through light, every aspect of it, that it really re does relate to the Bible. And in what ways, you know, we, we really need to learn more about what that, what the Bible has said about this. And, uh, and of course, it might sound like um, thinking a lot because of my own research that's gone into related to spectroscopy. It's all in very different forms of light and so on. But I've been concerned for many years that many of the things that are said about light are so trivial when the Bible is <laughs> indicating that God is light. That, uh, and when we won't need that sun and the moon in the future, when this era comes to an end, we didn't need it at the beginning until... So. We're to have unity and diversity. You know? And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we change a culture. It means that there is a kingdom culture, that we all have that kingdom culture, that uh, the Lord will allow us to express things in creative ways that relate to that culture. And that one of the beauties of YWAM, of course, has always been that we bring groups together and they, even if the language is not fully understood, we understand each other. So I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, this globalization will affect us unless we're doing it to make everything, to try to make everything the same. Um, in some sense, of course, that's what's happened in, you know, a lot of the culture in the West, which has resulted in very effective businesses and so on, then tend to almost try to make over another culture to fit that Western culture, which is unfortunate. The thing that encourages me about the U of N is the fact that it is the Lord's University. I mean, he is the one that has provided. He's given us an opportunity to cooperate with him in developing the university. And uh, I think as long as we continue to look to him, that where we have failed, where we have not heard accurately, that it will be rectified. The uh, thing that is so encouraging is to go to the different nations and uh, immediately feel bonded to the people. Those that have really learned the kingdom culture. Because it is just God speaking through these people and all of us, the potential of all of us doing what the Lord really wants us to. That's the encouraging thing. And of course the traps along the way are immense. The enemy would love to see us make the wrong moves. Think that uh, we're the ones that are doing it instead of that his direction through us and he using us and
my, you know, even with all the pitfalls and all of the things that have happened, you know, I think oftentimes a, a new program has a uh, period of time in which the Lord particularly strongly blesses and corrects our mistakes very quickly. Allows us to see where we've made mistakes. I think as we get bigger, this goes back to that big size, that is a little harder to maintain that unless we are referring back always to what the vision is. And if the vision is out there before all of our people, all of the time, then I don't think we're going to slip too far. But if we really start thinking that we have the answers, and now this is the formula that worked before, therefore let's go back to that, that we'll have trouble. You know, everyone says, of course, you know, here's what happens in universities. They start out with good principles, as many of our universities in the West have done, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in the United States. Uh, therefore, you're probably going to have the same thing happen after about, you know, 40 years or whatever time span they want to put in. We don't have to have that. But we will have that if, as has happened in many of those universities, they make one little move that's a mistake, and then another little move that's a mistake, and then it's easy to build on the next one and the next one. As many of our great universities, considered great universities today, did. And um, those are the things we have to have before us all the time. That's why I think it is important that we do write out some statements, and that was that challenge I felt from my own former doctoral people, that we write out what would make an ideal university, and everybody do it together. Yeah, and I think, I think we could conceivably within the next, uh, well, within the next decade, one more decade, have 50,000 students worldwide, and one more decade on that, we would be well over 100,000 students. So we can go big, but big going big isn't the answer. Uh, that isn't the thing that makes it will make it great or not. It's what's happening with what we do with what we have. And I guess one more little thing that feeds in that is that uh, in implementation of the program, as we go. And our program comes back to the overall vision of discipling a nation. That we get bigger and bigger projects. I've recently written this thing on what is considered by man as the greatest, the most complex, most difficult project of all time is the Apollo 11 project, which required billions of dollars tens and tens of thousands of people, new corporations being formed, new types of materials and so on to get a man on the moon and get him back again, all of that. But that's simple compared to discipling a nation. So does that say we're going to need the billions of dollars? Are we going to need the tens and tens of thousands of skilled people and whatnot? Well, possibly. But it's whatever the Lord leads us. To, and to recognize that there are certain things that the Lord led the people who were involved in the Power of Eleven project to produce and do to carry out an unbelievably complex project. Um, so, what uh, what are we going to do in terms of our planning? And then as we plan and get a project that if you look at the overall plan, which you want people to be able to plug into, you may be talking about certainly hundreds of millions and probably billions of dollars on some of those overall projects so that you could put everybody on the chart, so to speak, and say, here's what you need to do and what, you know, or they're learning what they're to do. Um, and I, uh, think that people 
that transition then into implementation is even bigger than going from the from the vision into the project itself because you say, oh man, you know, we had a hard time setting up a base with a hundred people that are going to need a budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, let alone now one that's going to require a couple billion dollars and so on. But it's at that point that that very simple thing again, the Lord has led you into it, has given you this led you in planning a particular way and you don't have any money and you don't and you and hopefully you've learned now not just going and asking what's the world's ways of getting a billion dollars but what do you have in hand and what do you do with it that day and that week and then how well do you listen for the next step that the Lord wants you to take and I, it's such a, I know, a ridiculous statement in a set, you know, from a point of view. But it's what we had in starting this university. We had no money. We had, from the world's point of view, we didn't have the expertise to set up a university that would, we could call the Lord's University. But as we did with what, did what we had, in our hand, used what we had in our hands. The Lord the next day would have someone else come aboard and the next day someone else come aboard and so on and we kept getting the resources that we needed. And I think he will continue to do that whether we now go to 50,000 campus or whatever. But if we start to plan, look, I know how to get this thing up to 50,000 students, 5,000 students, whatever it is. We're going to fall flat on our face. The problem is that we won't know that we're falling flat on our face until it happens. It'll look good, good idea. We have people who, we have people now coming aboard who have the kinds of expertise to make a big project work. In other words, the Lord every step of the way he gives the vision, he'll give you a plan, he'll give you the way of implementing uh, and we have to make sure that every step of the way, every step of the way, it's so simple that people don't pay attention to it. That's the problem all the time. Okay.